Can you forgive her? Alice. In the introduction video, I talked about how Alice is the protagonist of the novel Can You Forgive Her? She is, after all, the character whom we are being asked to forgive. Really, Alice's quandaries about who she's going to marry, perhaps even whether she's going to marry, um, as I said in the introduction, are the underlying drive uh, for the plot. Alice appears in all of the subplots in the novel and a number of the incidents in the subplots serve to illustrate their manifestations of perhaps what underlies Alice's doubts about getting married. Um, her, the subplot with Mrs Greenow, who is her aunt, who is beset by these two very mercenary lovers, is in some part Alice's own story. She is beset by one mercenary lover, George Vavasar. Um, Glencora's situation of being in a marriage with a man whom she doesn't love because she's been coerced into a marriage by her, her people um, is also perhaps what Alice fears as she could find herself in with John Gray she is perhaps fearful that there isn't enough passion either in her feelings for Grey or in Grey as a man and that life might very well descend into the uh, rather dull, um, monotonous relationship that Glencora feels herself to have with Plantagenet Palliser because she just simply isn't in love with Plantagenet. Nevertheless, or, or, and the, also the crucial fact to remember is that marriage was indissoluble at this time, or virtually indissoluble. It, it, even if it was possible to gain a divorce, it was a difficult process and it wasn't socially acceptable to do so. So, um, Yes, this will also be playing on Alice's mind, and she sees the inexorability of Glencora's situation, um, marital situation. So, we were asked the question of, of can you forgive her? Can we forgive Alice? Now, at the start of the novel, uh, there doesn't appear to be all that much, perhaps, to forgive. Um, she's quite well set up. Um, she is living a comfortable life of um, in fashionable society, a comfortable life in fashionable society for a young woman of the period coming from the social group to which she belongs. She is engaged to an eligible bachelor. Uh, John Gray is a gentleman. That's to say that he has descended from the landed class, uh, no doubt has, as Alice herself has, um, being a gentlewoman, um, connections with the British aristocracy, but he himself is not an aristocrat. He has a private income, he doesn't need to work for a living, and he has a, a small house and very small estate uh, that he owns in Cambridgeshire. He's an eligible bachelor, it's a good match, Alice herself has not got a great fortune and much as love matches were made in the 19th century, love matches usually had to be made uh, in such a way um, as was also convenient financially and um, often as was useful socially. So unless Alice were a great beauty, which is indicated she's not a great beauty, she's an attractive woman. Um, she was unlikely to be able to make a stupendous marital match in Victorian society. Um, so, why does um, Alice demur from marrying John Gray? Um, it would be an advantageous marriage for her. She would have her own home, she'd have her own family, she'd have her own 
interests to engage her. Um, John Gray is furthermore a very kind man. He's uh, very much in love with Alice. He's not perhaps demonstrative of his love, um, except in quite quiet, understated ways. But possibly um, that's not very different from many of the men whom she would have been meeting in any case. John Gray is additionally um, very liberal with regard to the um, behaviour that he allows Alice to engage in um, as his betrothed wife to be. Um, he allows her uh, to travel to the continent. He doesn't place any objection on her travelling to the continent unchaperoned with a female cousin of her own age who's also unmarried and with George Vavasor, the cousin to whom she's been previously engaged. It's a risky thing to say yes to, um, as anybody might probably guess, even in today's world, it's risky for a fiancé to allow his fiancé to uh, go travelling with her former fiancé. But nonetheless, Grey allows um, Alice this level of autonomy. As it transpires, it's a mistake, really, from his perspective. Although Alice has been declining to actually fix the day for their marriage, uh, the result of the trip to Europe is that she actually breaks the engagement. John Gray takes this very calmly. He, as a character, is able to absorb and to withstand uh, colossal levels of rejection without becoming angry, without becoming hurt, without becoming disaffected. This may or may not be realistic in his characterization. We'll discuss it later as well when we come to a topic that I will call the task of loving, which is a phrase that occurs in the novel. Um, at all events, John Gray seems to understand where other characters in the novel do not understand that Alice needs to be loved and to be loved unconditionally. Um, her um, sort of maternal guardian, so to speak, um, Lady MacLeod, doesn't really infuse her relationship with Alice with um, a great deal of um, love. A lot of it is about um, social codes, how to move in society, how to ensure your position in society and your children's position um, you know, ongoing in society. Other um, matriarchal figures in the background, um, there, there are a group of matriarchs, aristocratic matriarchs in the background. Again, um, they seek to move uh, Alice by um, according her their approval or removing their approval from her actions. Again, for a woman such as Alice, who is very independently minded and who um, has not had maternal authority exerted over her in her life from a young age, this is unlikely to be very effective psychologically. She's much more likely to react against uh, any advice that comes in those sorts of terms. Nevertheless, um, Alice does break her engagement with John Gray. This is what we have to um, consider whether we're going to forgive or not as readers. Um, and it may be as we try to consider whether or not we're going to forgive Alice that we need to think about why she's broken the engagement. What are her possible reasons? She tells John Gray that she doesn't think that she will be able to make him happy. He disagrees with that, um, although that's a typical response. In that way, he is realistic psychologically. It's a typical response of someone who's been rejected romantically. Um, it doesn't really ring true of all of Alice's experience, of all of Alice's thoughts. Really, um, 
we are aware of other barriers for Alice and the narrator discusses at great length the possible psychological um, and social reasons why Alice is not committing to her to a marriage with John Gray. We might um, take for one reason perhaps nostalgia for her relationship with George Vazifer. Uh, George whom she's just been uh, to the continent with. Um, the continent, continental Europe, um, for the British even today, uh, seems a lot more romantic, a lot more exotic than uh, the UK. Back in the 19th century it was even more so. Um, it was also a place um, which is to, you know, again just bear in mind John Gray's openness in allowing Alice to travel to the continent. It was a place that was considered to be immoral by comparison with the UK. Um, you know, standards of um, sort of sexual morality were considered to be a lot laxer on the continent than um, in the UK. That was probably true. Um, certainly writers like Madame de Stael tended to <laughs> entrench this viewpoint in many British people. Um, but of course she was writing fiction. Um, so it, it could be that this um, exotic trip to the continent in the company of George Vavasar um, went some way to allay the insult that George had given to um, Alice's love for him and she describes, or, or she uh, is described as feeling that he had insulted, insult is the word that's used, insulted her love. And this was because he had transgressed, it becomes clear later in the novel exactly the nature of this insult and it is that he had a mistress and obviously this had somehow become known to Alice. Notwithstanding perhaps um, the trip and spending time with George uh, ignited a level of nostalgia for her romance with him, her early feelings of love for him. He is um, a somewhat more swashbuckling type character than John Gray. He is more impulsive rather than passionate. Um, he's more self-interested than um, inspired um, in his career in life. He's worked in several different areas. Now he wants to move into politics. He seems to be really driven, yet when it comes to the campaign he has no actual policy that he wishes to campaign for and just takes one up to do with um, the embankment and um, improving the quality of the structure of the embankment of the Thames River in London in order to have something to campaign on. What George really wants from a career in Parliament is the kudos. Uh, the um, spin-offs that he will gain by being invited to be on certain um, boards of, of companies and banks. He sees it really as his path to um, being materially successful in life and to being able to um, um, confirm the social standing that he has as the um, heir of um, a country squire in the north of England. So George appears to be more exciting, appears to be more passionate, appears to be um, perhaps in many ways more masculine, traditionally masculine, um, than the retiring John Gray who looks forward to being an independent scholar for the career of his life. Um, perhaps another reason why Alice feels that she should withdraw from the engagement with John Gray is um, 
an idea that existed in the 19th century that a woman should only ever actually fall in love once. That to fall in love twice was to be a little bit uh, risque. Um, to experience those kinds of feelings as an unmarried woman and as an inexperienced woman more than once for a man suggested um, an excess of, uh, as one might say, animal spirits. Um, in which case, Alice almost compounds the issue, I think, uh, for the Victorian mind in now jilting John Gray and going back, back to George Vavasor. The reason um, for having jilted in the first place might have been quite well known um, in society, in society that surrounded her at the time. I think it's highly likely that it would have been, or at least guessed at. Um, so perhaps, as John Gray puts it to Alice, she's uh, pining after, or that she's, she's trapped within these indefinable regrets for the past, um, which, as he say, says, often drive, drive men to self-destruction. And if that is what's going on with Alice, I think uh, he comes close to hitting the nail on the head, because I think Alice's course with... George Vavasor, to whom she does re-engage herself, is nothing short of self-destructive. Alice may, perhaps alternatively, be um, unsure of her capacity to love. Um, and that perhaps brings us a little bit back again to Trollope's own description of, of Alice, and that is that she is unattractive. Perhaps Alice does come forward as a little still. Perhaps Alice's ability to stimulate passion within herself for John Gray, who is a handsome man, whom she finds very attractive, whom she enjoys being with, but she can't feel this passion for him. And perhaps she is just a little bit blocked in that direction. Um, we just discussed before how um, her mother had died when she was very young. And although women weren't heading out into careers in the 19th century and needing that kind of support and mentoring, the, 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 the whole process of getting married in the 19th century was um, really constituted quite choppy waters, especially for women. Women often had to make the decision to marry a man whom they weren't particularly in love with or weren't particularly attracted to because if they didn't, they would be left financially destitute. Um, or if they didn't get married, uh, even if they were quite wealthy or could be quite independently wealthy as a, as a single woman because they would be left money by their family, um, their social status as an unmarried woman was always less than that of a married woman. But lots of women, although of course legally um, they were under their husband's jurisdiction and were obliged to obey their husbands legally at this period. Um, and obedience crops up quite a lot in this novel with regard to a wife's behaviour um, towards her husband. Um, they, um, women often, though, nonetheless thought of marriage as giving them a level of freedom because they would have their own her household. And as the woman of the house, they would be in charge of the house and the running of the house. Um, and because the idea of a woman in the middle classes, upper middle classes, an aristocracy, of having a career was not really even thought about. It just didn't come into the question. Um, this, this role assumed a lot of importance. It was the only role, really, that was open to women. And... As I say, they, they often saw it as giving them quite a lot of freedom. We can see this in uh, very clearly in Pride and Prejudice, uh, when Charlotte gets married to uh, Mr Collins, with whom she's absolutely not in love, but she's very happy and satisfied at this late stage in her late 20s, um, late stage for the period, um, that she's got married and found her own household, her own establishment that she can run and be in charge of. Um, so, as I say, um, 
negotiating the choppy waters of marriage um, in the 19th century was hard for women. And it was a very delicate issue to be able to achieve matrimony um, and also to have a satisfactory emotional life tied up and tied with, to and within that. Uh, this is the problem for Glencora, that satisfying emotional life is not there with Plantagenet Palliser. Um, it's the issue that Mrs Greenow has to deal with between her two lovers. Eventually, I think that Mrs Greenow decides to choose the man whom she finds physically most attractive. Uh, and she'll take her lot with uh, the rest of the package. She believes that she can control her new husband. Um, so Alice hasn't had this guidance, and she hasn't had a mother's love through the years either. Her father is very detached, and we discussed this, uh, well, I discussed this in the um, introduction. So... Alice may be suffering from issues of self-worth and self-confidence when it comes to how she's going to sustain the relationship with John Gray. Um, how am I to talk to him day after day, night after night? And I think that this is an issue of self-confidence. Additionally, Alice sees John Gray as perfect, which she doesn't see herself as perfect. And I think this is very daunting. Interestingly, her father, John Vavasor, who struggles as well with issues of self-worth and self-confidence, probably to do with his position in family of not being the primogenitor, so not being uh, the one who will inherit the squire's estates and having to do something to make his own way in the world because he's not as important as his brother. Um, not inherently, but just by an act of faith, uh, sorry, not an act of faith, an act of fate, um, in terms of his birth. Um, so John Vavasor also says that, that John Gray is, is a shade too good. Uh, he seems not to like him, although um, he gets together with him and has confidential conversations with him with regard to Alice's uh, situation with George and also protecting Alice financially, uh, he colludes with John Gray over that um, and is happy to do so. It could be that Alice is expressing um, subconsciously um, some of the malaise that was emerging around the institution of marriage um, at this period, or which had emerged um, and appeared uh, in parliamentary discussions and debates uh, in the late 1850s, particularly 1857 was a year in which there was a lot of debate around marriage in the Houses of Parliament. Um, the idea of one party holding dominion and absolute sway within an intimate and an inexorable or indissoluble relationship may also have been weighing heavily on Alice's mind. And it may have weighed heavily on the minds of many women, especially at this period as discussion about women's rights within marriage um, was arising. Women's human rights were pretty much across the board, um, reduced in the 19th century. Women, and I think it's worth making the point, uh, were not in a position to express their sexuality, particularly during the course of the 19th century. Um, but they also had many other human rights removed from them because of the fact of being a woman. So they were in this double bind situation, and it's worth remembering um, the extent of civil rights abuse which was simply present within the Constitution and had been for centuries. During the late um, 1850s, um, women were beginning to question this position that they had held uh, for centuries of being um, subjugated within um, European society. In the 
United Kingdom, um, one of the uh, women who founded the women's rights movement was Barbara Lee Smith, um, or her married name, Barbara Baudichon. In 1854, um, Barbara wrote the, um, a brief summary in plain language of the most important laws concerning women. And I think that it's forgotten the extent to which women were really removed from um, public life and from um, they were excluded from the possibility of determining their own situation legally. And so I'm going to read out some of the things that um, Barbara Lee Smith put into this document. Um, this document was compiled uh, by uh, Barbara Lee Smith with the help of um, Matthew Davenport Hill, who was um, a lawyer and penologist um, specialising in the area of criminal criminology that handles the philosophy and practice of how different societies regulate and repress crime. So it wasn't just um, the interpretation uh, by um, a woman who was not um, educated to interpret the law. There was um, highly respected legal assistance given to her in drawing up this document. So I'll mention, I won't read it all, but I'll read some points which seem to me to be highly relevant. <clears throat> Matrimony is a civil and indissoluble contract between a consenting man and woman of competent capacity. A man and woman are one person in law. The wife loses all her rights as a single woman, and her existence is entirely absorbed in that of her husband. He is civilly responsible for her acts. She lives under his protection or cover, and her condition is called coverture. A woman's body belongs to her husband. She is in his custody and he can enforce his right by a writ of habeas corpus. What was her personal property before marriage, such as money in hand, money at the bank, jewels, household goods, clothes, etc., becomes absolutely her husband's and he may assign or dispose of them at his pleasure whether he and his wife live together or not. So there, there are a number of other um, features with regard to property that Barbara Baudichon um, or Barbara Lee Smith uh, outlines, um, but they all do ultimately return to the fact that the property within the marriage, any property that has been previously owned by the wife, is now owned by the husband. Um, another important point that um, is made in this summary is that money earned by a married woman belongs absolutely to hus her husband. That and all sources of income, excepting those mentioned above, are included in the term personal property. By particular permission of her husband, she can make a will of her personal property for by such a permission he gives up his right, but he may revoke his permission at any time before probate. So. The legal custody of children belongs to the father. During the lifetime of a sane father, the mother has no rights over her children, except a limited power over infants, and the father may take them from her and dispose of them as he thinks. Um, so in legal terms, then, a married woman cannot sue or be sued for contracts, nor can she enter into contracts except as the agent of her husband. That is to say, her word alone is not binding in law, and persons giving a wife credit have no remedy against her. As the wife acts under the command and control of her husband, 
she is excused from punishment for certain offences, such as theft, burglary, housebreaking, etc., if committed in his presence and under his influence. A wife cannot be found guilty of conceiving her felon husband or of conceiving a felon jointly with her husband. She cannot be found guilty of stealing from her husband or of setting his house on fire, as they are one person in law. A husband and wife cannot be found guilty of conspiracy, as that offence cannot be committed unless there are two persons. And there is only one person in a marriage at this period, and that is the husband. When a woman has consented to a proposal of marriage, she cannot dispose or give away her property without the knowledge of her betrothed. If she make any such disposition without his knowledge, even if he be ignorant of the existence of her property, the disposition will not be legal. And this is an interesting clause as well um, when we read this book um, in consideration of how George behaves towards um, Alice's money uh, during the course of their engagement. He really considers it to be his to use and his right to use. Um, and in many respects, although he, he's, not, he's not legally um, in control of the money, he considers it to be at his disposal now that he's married to Alice. And she also concurs with that. And this isn't um, just weakness on Alice's part. Uh, can see it. There is some legal position uh, for this situation between them. Um, and it's an interesting point, actually, that the novel makes about uh, betrothal and marriage. So Caroline Norton, um, in the same year, uh, wrote a letter to the Queen, a letter to the Queen on Lord Chancellor Cranford's marriage and divorce bill. And this was written by Caroline Norton, whose maiden name was Sheridan. A couple of the points that um, Caroline Norton makes are an English wife cannot legally claim her own earnings, whether wages for manual labour or payment for intellectual exertion, whether she weed potatoes or keep a school, her salary is the husband's, and he could compel a second payment and treat the first as void if paid to the wife without his sanction. An English wife may not leave her husband's house. Not only can he sue her for restitution of conjugal rights, but he has a right to enter the house of any friend or relation with whom she may take refuge, and who may, and who may harbour her, as it is termed, and carry her away by force, with or without the aid of the police. If the wife sue for separation for cruelty, it must be cruelty that endangers life or limb. And if she has once forgiven, or in legal phrase, condoned his offences, she cannot plead them, though her past forgiveness only proves that she endured as long as endurance was possible. If her husband take proceedings for a divorce, she is not in the first instance allowed to defend herself. She has no means of proving the falsehood of his allegations. She is not represented by attorney, nor permitted to be considered a party to the suit between him and her supposed lover for damages. So, um, yes, uh, Together, these um, two documents um, say a lot about the situation for women uh, within marriage. Following the publication of Barbara Lee Smith Bodichon's uh, A Brief Summary or in Plain Language of the Most Important Laws Concerning Women in 1854, the Law Amendments Society discussed um, legal um, issues to do, to do with marriage, and as a result, Lord Brougham and Erskine Perry brought before Parliament a bill entitled the Married Women's Property Bill. This um, aimed at establishing the same property rights for married women as for single women. 
Uh, initially, the bill was quite well received and it passed its second reading in Parliament easily. However, there was a feeling um, at the time amongst many that in, in power, in Parliament, and generally within the establishment, that the bill was way too radical. And another bill was introduced by Lord Lyndhurst, which was the Matrimonial Causes Bill, which was eventually passed as an Act of Parliament in 1857. The Matrimonial Causes Act largely deals with divorce, and the um, main um, innovation that it introduces is a court to handle divorce. Previously, the only body in the land which could grant a divorce was Parliament. However, the causes or the um, yeah, causes for, dis to, for divorce remained the same. For the case of the husband, it was adultery committed by the wife. In the case of the wife, it was adultery and also cruelty or desertion by the husband. So there was an inequality um, still in um, how a divorce could be sought. Um, to offset the disappointment of the defeat of the Married Women's Property Bill and perhaps to delay or defer or to put a stop on um, further attempts to increase women's rights within marriage, um, the Matrimonial Causes Act contained a couple of clauses that were derived from the Married Women's Property Bill. So that um, women's property uh, following separation was protected by the bill and also a separated woman's income was protected by the new bill. So despite all of these issues that women were expressing um, as being present in marriage at the period, uh, the narrator in um, Can You Forgive Her um, says quite succinctly with regard to Alice's doubts, Alice Vavasor had thought too much about it. I feel quite sure. Um, I think that I feel quite sure um, does throw a little into question uh, the extent to which the narrator is sure um, that the only problem is that Alice has thought too much about it. Um, Nonetheless, um, he goes on to uh, be quite patronising, uh, really, towards uh, the early women's rights movement in trying to uh, create a wider scope for women in society. He speaks of the women... Um, beginning this movement as the flock of learned ladies, which is, of course, in itself belittling. Um, and it seems also to regard as entirely unnecessary uh, any question with regard to what should a woman do with her life. Um, so this, uh, these this discussion occurs in chapter 11, John Gray Goes to London. Um, i just read this paragraph. That Alice Vavasor had thought too much about it, I feel quite sure. She had gone on thinking of it till she had filled herself with a cloud of doubts which even the sunshine of love was unable to drive from, from, the, from her heavens. That a girl should really love the man she intends to marry, that, at any rate, may be admitted. But love generally comes easily enough. With all her doubts, Alice never doubted her love for Mr Grey, nor did she doubt his character, nor his temper, nor his means. But she had gone on thinking of the matter till her mind had become filled with some undefined idea of the importance to her of her own life. What should a woman do with her life? There had arisen around her a flock of learned ladies asking that question, to whom it seems that the proper answer has never yet occurred. Fall in love, 
marry the man, have two children and live happy ever afterwards. I maintain that answer has as much wisdom in it as any other that can be given, or perhaps more. The advice contained in it cannot perhaps always be followed to the letter, but neither can the advice of the other kind, which is given by the flock of learned ladies who ask the question. Well, um, the question of whether a woman is in love with her husband when she marries uh, or not was quite a, a fraught issue in the 19th century. Caroline Norton, for example, was not in love with Charles Norton when they married. She married um, out of expediency. He was very highly attracted to her. Uh, he wanted to marry her. Uh, there was no prospect otherwise of marriage available to her. She'd been on the single scene for a little while and she felt it was expedient to marry Charles Norton. And this was a common case. Um, so, it's slightly naive or disingenuous of Trollope to put it like this, I think. And of course, because so many wars were fought at this period, there were often simply not enough men to go round. And one of the big issues in the middle of the 19th century was that there was such a large number of unmarried women with no means of supporting themselves. There were very few um, uh, um, work training opportunities open to women. Their basic education was often not sufficient to enable them to be even secretaries, really. Um, and there weren't um, positions for them in the post office and places because they were often not, not good enough at counting or, 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 or doing arithmetic. Um, there was no training available in art and design, which would have been sort of natural um, progressions of the type of education, the type of very sort of um, very limited education that women were receiving, but often there was a high emphasis placed on a woman's ability to draw or to paint. So careers in design, textile design, or um, ceramic design and, and painting and decoration were, would be a natural progression perhaps for a woman, but there were very few opportunities to train until later in the century. Um, so, for these unmarried women, it wasn't necessarily easy for a woman to get married at all. Children might as well very, might as, as well very well not come, come along. Um, that was also quite common in the 19th century, and if children didn't arrive, there was really nothing that could be done about it. It was just a question of waiting and hoping. It wasn't like today. And it's again somewhat disingenuous of, of Trollope to be critical of the women's movement for not having uh, any very many ideas about what a woman should do with her life and apart from get married. Because the women's movement wasn't sufficiently advanced yet to have been able to construct pathways for women to move into. That all took time. Women coming into public life. Uh, in the United Kingdom took time. It took overcoming a great deal of prejudice um, and in order to create the educational pathways and the training pathways for women to take up, take up occupations that they felt um, you, you know able to un undertake um, all took time. As Trollope says, um, Alice Vavasor was not so far advanced as to think that women should be lawyers and doctors or to wish that she might have the privilege of the franchise. Um, of course, some women were beginning to fight for these things, but it was very much at the pioneer stage. Um, what Alice is convinced about, though, is that she will have no scope for action in the life in Cambridgeshire which Mr. Gray was preparing for her. So that, that's a quote. She would have no scope, scope for action in the life in Cambridgeshire.
Cambridgeshire, which Mr Gray was preparing for her. Um, yet her situation is, is so constructed by the author for her, quote, not to know herself what she meant by action. Rather, I think, patronisingly as well, Trollope suggests that for Alice, action would be um, somehow behind the scenes heroically rescuing uh, her husband in different ways, who was caught up in um, <laughs> righteous political struggles which were somehow illegal. Um, and perhaps this is how Alice sees herself um, alongside George Vavasor, that he is working hard to make something of himself uh, in the world and she could be there to support that struggle and that there would be a sense of achievement uh, in his arrival um, in public affairs at a national level uh, if she'd been in the background assisting and supporting and perhaps giving advice here and there. The problem with all of this is though of course that George Vavasor is very reckless and he's not really interested in listening to other people's opinions or ideas. Um, he's only really interested in, in taking and careering forth uh, on whatever he thinks will be his quick, quickest route uh, to achieving what he's aiming at. Um, Trollope um, discusses much more than what a woman should do with her life. The importance is the manner in which a woman does what she does with her life. Um, let's try to find that. Yes, a woman's life is important to her, as is that of a man to him, not chiefly in regard to that which she shall do with it. The chief thing for her is... To to look to is the manner in which that something shall be done. And this is um, a kind of gender stereotype that was very um, pervasive at the period um, to do with the moral aspect of a woman. Women were regarded as the moral guardians of society. They would bring up and be the chief uh, forming influence of their children's uh, moral codes and moral perspectives on life, um, which probably included, um, you know, uh, maintaining the family honour, maintaining the family social position uh, for this sort of level, this sort of rung of society. Um, so. Again, really, it, it comes down to the fact that women are in the background and that that's where they should stay. Because the, the, the something um, which a woman should do in her life is, of course, to get married and have the two children, which uh, occurred in, in the, the previous quote that I read from the novel. Um, So another quote, she thought too much of all this, and was, if I may say, overprudent in calculating the chances of her happiness and of his. I suppose there were lots of happy marriages in the 19th century. It would be wrong to suggest that there weren't. Um, marriage did work, probably for the majority of people. Um, individuality and individual needs were not so definedly asserted um, by individuals at this period in social history. It is very much a 20th century construction. Um, individuality was prized, but not to the um, sort of almost all-consuming level that uh, it is today. So that um, often individual needs were less disruptive to social codes, social conventions, social arrangements, uh, such as marriage, um, than they can be today. So, men as well as women were expected to step back from the things that they personally wanted and to undertake their duty to their family, 
to their spouse, to their country. Um, some of the demands made upon women and the legal subjugation of women were really, I think, excessive. Um, but because people took a step back from their own needs and wants at this period, um, especially I think that marriages, although they were, were, wouldn't have been perfect, that a lot of people were reasonably happy in their marriages. Um, Alice is probably not happy within herself. And I think one of the ways in which this comes forward is the green drawing room. Um, many of, of Alice's uh, most uh, difficult moments in the novel, uh, many uh, highly disturbing incidents for her as a character and indeed for the sympathetic re reader occur in the green drawing room. And George Vavasor is, is absolutely savage to her in the green drawing room. Um, she is um, quite graphically uh, discomforted by um, physical contact uh, between herself and George Vavasor in this room. Uh, it's a little bit um, squeamish, actually. And um, even uh, to some extent with John Gray in the green drawing room, she is not happy with um, some of the contact between them, although not to the extreme extent as I think with George. So many of Alice's emotional scenes occur here. Also her sense of desolation and loneliness occur a great deal in the green drawing room. And the point about the drawing room is that she found this house for herself and her father to live in in London. And she clearly, uh, in her mind's eye, had the idea that it would be a home for them, that they could both enjoy and enjoy living together. Um, she seems to have wanted to try to, um, after she's grown up, try to capture some of the um, familial atmosphere that just wasn't there during her childhood and teenage years. She, she was sent away to school. Um, however, um, her father is very rarely present in the house. He um, spends most of his leisure time, of which he, despite having some form of a... <laughs> <laughs> a sinecure of a job. Um, he has a great deal of leisure time outside of this sinecure and um, he's very rare, very rarely at home. He spends most of his time out at his club and socialising with his friends. Alice is there a great deal on her own. When she took the house, um, in order to um, assist her father in having a sense of attachment with the house, um, and in feeling that you, you know he was involved with it, she um, gave over to him the decoration of the drawing room. However, he contracted that to um, <laughs> a firm of decorators, and what what they created was this really oppressive green drawing room in which absolutely everything is green, <laughs> and is clearly most unattractive. Neither Alice nor her father enjoy the drawing room. Um, her father suggested to her that you know he would be prepared to pay for her to have it redecorated according to her taste, but Alice declines to do so. And I think that this de declining is very um, symbolical. Alice is basically acknowledging that uh, the relationship that she um, hoped to find with her father in this uh, house is not existent, and that it won't be existent, and that she has actually given away her hope of uh, that that love being present in her life. And um, it is quite sad, I think. I think that when someone gives way to the idea that such um, a basic uh, structure of love is not present in their lives, um, and it may very well not be, but at the point of actually conceding that this is not there, 
uh, the person may be subconsciously as well letting go of the hope of uh, any other meaningful, significant, unconditional love being present in their life. So um, Alice rejects the beautiful Nethercoats house and garden which John Gray is busily preparing for her arrival, um, all the things that she had indicated or said might be nice if they were here or, or there, not that she was actually requesting them but she was just commenting, he uh, puts into place and arranges for her. Alice veers away from the beautiful Nethercoat. She, she can't believe in stepping into the, the, this, this level of love. Um, the green drawing room is, is where she's stuck. Um, in the case of Glencora, who is caught up in a marriage based on duty and her husband's um, desire to maintain the status of his family by marrying an heiress, Glencora nonetheless does not lose sight of her essential lovability. She does not lose sight of her attractiveness as a woman of her femininity. Um, and an assumption that she is there to be loved, that she's there to be cherished. She's very attractive to the reader, in part because she believes so much in her lovability. Uh, her uh, private sitting room, her boudoir, is exquisitely decorated um, and is even um, to an extent amalgamated with her character. It's a part of Glencora. It's a very uh, important expression of who Glencora is as a character. Um, and Glencora goes on believing uh, in um, believing in love and believing that love will reach her. Um, she's mistaken, probably, in believing that that's through Burgo Fitzgerald. Um, because that would lead to, really... Uh, it's such a social downfall for her, she would never then be in a position of um, social acceptability afterwards. But um, by going on believing in the idea that love will come to her, that love will reach her, that she is there to be loved, um, of course, eventually she wins her husband's love and he wins hers. Um, Alice in the green drawing room is, is really uh, a lot more doubtful about the capacity of love to find her in her life.